it's my distinct honor and privilege to bring out our next keynote speaker, who is the Deputy Cabinet Secretary and Senior Advisor to Governor Brown. Many of you probably either know Wade or are very familiar with his work. Um, I was first introduced to him when he was working um, as an aide and as the senior environmental aide to then the mayor of San Francisco, Mr. Gavin Newsom, and he has continued to work within state politics and to be one of the leaders that has formed the way that the governor has been able to implement some of the key environmental victories, especially around clean energy and energy efficiency. So let me introduce Mr. Wade Crowfoot. Great. So thanks so much for uh, having me here today. Uh, a close family friend named Bob Russell uh, passed away last year, and Bob was a longtime participant in Bioneers and uh, is from my home state of Michigan, and parenthetically Tom Hay Hayden's home state of Michigan, and actually brought the Bio Bioneers satellite to Michigan and ultimately northern Michigan, where he and his wife Sally have run an environmental nonprofit called the Nia Tawanta Center. And I've never participated in Bioneers, but Bob would call me when he was coming out here in the early years. and. Uh, when I connected with him, he was always so excited about the work that Bioneers uh, was doing and, and now continues to do. So I just wanted to say um, I'm excited to be here to honor his legacy of participation in Bioneers and also uh, probably many of, of, of you who have been uh, part of making Bioneers what it is, which is really a cornerstone to push us in government on a lot of the issues we'll talk about here today. So I want to just briefly build on um, Tom's presentation and talk about where we've come on climate in California and where we're headed. And of course, my perspective is from the, the governor's office because I work for Governor Brown. Um, and so, uh, and then hopefully I'll, I'll end with um, a couple of uh, stories from this summer that really drive home the urgency and importance of taking action. So you all know that in 2007, California did what almost no other government in the world uh, had done at that time, which is put in law the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. So a lot of politicians stand up and say, we're going to hit this target by 2050 or 2030. But the legislature and the governor at that time passed a law that, that made it uh, mandated that California would reduce its greenhouse gas emissions to 1990 levels by the year 2020, which was a big deal. Part of that law was empowering the state agencies to actually put in place the regulations necessary to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. That law, AB 32, passed. The California Air Resources Board created a scoping plan with over 70 specific measures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And many of the programs that you know about today, whether it's the Renewable Portfolio Standard or the uh, Cap and Trade Program or the, the so-called Low Carbon Fuel Standard, those were all pieces of AB 32. Now, you know, seven years on, uh, 2014, about halfway through that period of reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, for AB 32, I'm pleased to say uh, in California we will hit that AB 32 target, that 1990 level uh, target, which is great. And it's a credit, it's a credit to, to government, it's also a credit to the activism in the room. Uh, but as we know, you could really use a metaphor of choosing two different pathways, um, the traditional pathway or a low carbon pathway. And AB 32 was important because it put us on a new uh, pathway where the, where the paths diverged. But we're only a few steps down that path. And ultimately our goal uh, as state policy is to reach uh, by 2050 an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. You all know that that transformation is necessary say the scientists, to achieve uh, a climactic balance. And so uh, what are we doing uh, toward that end? There, we really describe the effort towards the 2050 goal in, in sort of three legs of the stool. There's, there are other uh, areas such as agriculture that I won't touch on, but, but three important legs of the stool. The first is vastly scaling up energy efficiency. Now, energy efficiency is not the sexiest of environmental technologies. It's been around for a while, but California has demonstrated remarkable effectiveness in energy efficiency. You may know that the average Californian consumes half of the energy of the average American, in large part because of these invisible building standards that were put in place uh, 40 years ago. But we can and we should do more. I mean, it's remarkable. I, 
I, I have a smartphone like, like most in the room, and if, you, if we brought Alexander Graham Bell back, you know, the inventor of the telephone, and you showed him this, th this instrument, he would have no idea what it was. Now, if you brought back Thomas Edison, who, the inventor of the electrical grid, and took him outside and showed him a power line or an electrical transformer, not only would he recognize it, he would be able to explain it. Our perspective is, in order to enable energy efficiency, it contain, we, we need to essentially unleash the amazing uh, technology innovation that exists in California and the world through policy. And hopefully part of what you'll talk about today is, you know, really how you enable game-changing uh, technologies in, in energy efficiency. So that's, that's area number one. Area number two is we need to squeeze the carbon out of energy generation. Uh, and we're, we're down that path. The renewable portfolio standard will require that by 2020, one-third of the energy that we consume in California comes from renewable resources. But our goal is, of course, an 80% reduction. So we have to vastly scale up that renewable energy. And until we actually um, achieve a much uh, cheaper, larger energy storage, um, part of our transition is relying on natural gas. Uh, because solar and wind are intermittent forms of energy and uh, we can't turn them off and on when we want to. So if we can't store them, we need other sources of power that can ramp up when needed. So, you know, this is, it's about expanding renewable energy, but it's also about creating uh, a transmission and distribution grid um, that can take on more and more renewable energy. The third major action we're focused on is electrifying transportation. Now, most of us drove here today uh, in a car if we didn't take the bus or, or bike. I have a, uh, a plug-in electric vehicle, but the fact is we rely on fossil fuels. And they're the same, the same you know, uh, carbon-creating uh, energy form that we need to reduce uh, in order to maintain life on this planet. So in California, we're very focused on actually building consumer choice for different energy sources to power transportation. Electric vehicles, whether battery electric vehicles or fuel cell electric vehicles, are a major part of that solution. We're very excited that 40% of the electric cars in, in, the, in, the, in the country are actually sold in California. We're considered by the automakers the largest market for EVs in the world. But guess what? We just passed a milestone of 100,000 vehicles, EVs, in California. You know how many cars we have in California? 31 million. So it shows you we're just at the beginning of this transformation uh, uh, in terms of uh, moving to a different energy source. Of course, California has fuel efficiency standards and emission standards that now the Obama administration has adopted, so we're making conventional fuels uh, more efficient, but ultimately we're not gonna reach that 2050 goal until we fully switch uh, the source of our transportation fuel to a cleaner source of energy. Another key piece of, of electrification is high-speed rail. And frankly, I tell a lot of my friends who work for environmental organizations, we need more environmental support for high-speed rail. It's an easy project to criticize. It's a big, audacious, expensive, long-term project in an era where citizens don't trust the government to deliver such projects. But in the 22 countries where high-speed rail has been introduced, it has been an absolute game-changer, moving people out of cars and off planes onto, onto rail. And you may know in high-speed rail in California will be 100% renewable. So the idea is you will have a zero uh, fossil fuel generation in moving from uh, Northern California to Southern California and back. Incidentally, it's the, short, it's the, most, it's the busiest short haul market for air travel in the United States. And so we, we, the way we explain it, it's not you're choosing between high speed rail and the status quo. No, we're, we will be a state of 50 million people in a matter of decades. And the question is how are we gonna expand our transportation infrastructure? Are we going to expand our airports? Think about the Bay Area at sea level. Would that make sense? Um, are we going to expand the I-5, uh, the, the 99, possibly double-decker in some places? Or are we going to make a transformational change? And so that's why we're so passionate uh, about high-speed rail. Key questions towards 2050, and I'll be candid about this, and we may not all agree in this room on, on the answers, but these are the questions. One is, what's the next target? So we have in law this target to 2020, and we feel good about ourselves and pat each other on the back for meeting that target. But if we're going to reach this, this 2050 goal, this 80% reduction, what's the 2030 goal? And when will we put it into law? And what 
programs and policies and incentives are we willing to take on to meet that 2030 goal? That's one of the key questions over the, the next year or two. Secondly, as Tom mentioned, you know, this is not all sweetness and light in California. The oil industry and many oil companies are fighting back fiercely on even continuing the programs that we have in place. You may have heard about a so-called so hidden gas, take, uh, gas tax that will take effect on January 1st. That's because fuels, uh, for the first time, are coming under the cap and trade program, which limits the amount of, of carbon generated. And we're also instituting the low carbon fuel standard that's requiring um, the carbon content of fuel to, to be reduced. So not only do we need to sort of um, envision and, and materialize the next step towards the 2080 path, we also need to fight this rear guard action to, uh, to stop progress, uh, even towards that 2020 target. The other key question that is a tough one, and, and frankly, I don't think that there's a lot of uh, alignment around an answer, is what do you do about the fossil fuel that's in the ground? Um, and this gets talked a lot about uh, uh, by uh, folks that are um, as part of the anti-fracking movement. And I believe there was an article in, in Rolling Stone recently by Bill McKibben that essentially quantified the amount of fossil fuel underground on the planet and said, look, it's, you know, it's fine that we're, uh, uh, you know, advancing all of these efforts to make uh, energy usage more efficient, et cetera, but unless we keep some of this fossil fuel in the ground, uh, there won't be a solution to climate change. And so how does that actually manifest in local policy or state policy or federal policy or even international negotiations? Key question. As Tom mentioned, in California, we're focused on you know, continuing California's model that we can be an economy that grows, but grows on a new pathway that reduces carbon emissions. I worked for almost a decade in local government in San Francisco, and oftentimes what you heard is, oh, that's great, but you're San Francisco, or you're Berkeley, or you're Marin. Uh, that's fine, but you're kind of a boutique city, or you're the Bay Area, uh, you, know, you live in a bubble. Well, nobody can dismiss that if California can do it, uh, other places can too, because it's, a, it's the eighth largest economy of the world. It has um, many of the challenges that uh, nations face. And so what we're showing is actually um, we can, while we're reducing greenhouse gas emissions like we have since 2007, our economic uh, growth and prosperity can outpace the rest of the country and the rest of the world. So that's one, is keeping the momentum going towards the 2050 goal. The other, as Tom mentioned, is really uh, spreading, spreading the gospel, as it were. Um, Governor Brown has been to China, he's been to Mexico, he's been to Germany. He was just at the United Nations in New York City for the big climate summit. And his message is, we can't wait. And there are models and there are solutions right now, and it's a matter of political will. Uh, the governor has talked about going to Lima, Peru for the next uh, stage of the international negotiations this December and then being present in Paris in 2015, which is really where the rubber meets the road. Probably shouldn't use that metaphor uh, in, this, in this speech, but um, uh, really that, that will decide in large part whether there can be an international agreement on, on climate change. And I'll say this, I had the opportunity to staff the governor in China and have done a lot of the follow-up work um, with the Chinese. The Chinese totally get it. And what's refreshing about, you go to China, there's no debate about whether climate change exists or who's creating climate change. They're always very good about reminding us that we have that debate in our country. Um, but as Tom said, you know, they're, they're trying to um, raise over a billion people out of poverty. And the prosperity that you and I enjoy on a daily basis was built in part on hundreds of years of um, you know, fossil fuel usage. So from our perspective in California, if, we're, if China and India and these developing economies, as we like, you know, use that term, are actually going to pursue a low carbon pathway, we have to do it with them. It can't be something imposed on them and they can't, it can't be a decision about economic growth um, versus uh, environmental stewardship. So we're very excited with what's happening. We think that California can continue to be a model that will show the world what we can do and at the same time partner with other countries to actually help their efforts. I'll lastly say this has been an alarming and somewhat sobering summer on the topic of, of climate change. Uh, among other responsibilities, I'm, uh, I coordinate our drought response in, uh, in the governor's office as well as uh, wildfires, basically emergency management. And you may know that just three and a half hours uh, to the south and east of here, there are California residents without water, reminiscent of almost like the Dust Bowl 100 years ago. And, uh, 
the governor received a letter, which was just a really poignant letter from a woman named Jean Wilson in Madera County. And I actually called her back. And of course, not every constituent letter gets the response that I was able to give to this woman, Jean Wilson. Um, but I talked to her and I've, I've kept uh, the communication with her. She wrote this desperate letter to the governor because she said, my neighbors are knocking on my door, some of them elderly, um, with empty bottles asking for water. This is in California in 2014. A lot of these families have lived in their homes for decades and have never experienced their domestic wells running dry. The drought, of course, has created this. With reduced surface water supplies, there's increased groundwater pumping. The shortest straws in the milkshake are those domestic wells, those private wells in rural areas. And they've run out of water. And there's no easy solution. We've enabled disaster funding assistance to provide bottled water um, to these residents on a temporary basis. But the longer term uh, solution is much more expensive and difficult to figure out. So, you know, 10 years ago when we talk about climate change, people envision, you know, the um, proverbial polar bear and melting ice cap. We need to be able to explain to people in our communities, this is, this is about protecting the future of the planet, but it's also about protecting people in the state, right? And secondly, um, so that, that's drought, and that's, that's the reality we're living. And, and the, the science is very clear. Warming temperatures in California mean more winter rain, less winter snow, more of that rain runs off in the winter, less of it is uh, kept in the mountains that slowly melts and provides supply. So climate change will drive more, more persistent drought in California. This will become increasingly the new normal. On wildfires, you may have heard about the King Fire east of Sacramento, between Sacramento and Lake Tahoe uh, last month. That fire gained 15 miles in one single day. Our, our wildfire, our CAL FIRE leadership said they've never seen wildfires spread like that. And in fact, some of the, wild, uh, the firefighters who were out there digging lines had to shelter in place using um, a very rare technique of this fire shelter where you basically dig yourself in the ground and let the fire pass over you uh, because the fire moves so quickly. Now, you know, they're not, they're not a bunch of environmentalists sitting around talking about climate change, but what they're seeing is they're, they're saying um, uh, fires are hotter and more aggressive than they ever have been as a result of the dry vegetation and the drought and also as a result of the uh, hot summer weather. Again, the new normal in California. And what's the human cost of the people that lost homes in that fire or other fires? What's the economic cost um, when we're pulling into the general fund uh, month after month on emergency firefighting responses? So increasingly, I think many of the people in this room are motivated by a sort of an environmental stewardship of the planet. But I think these um, experiences in California will, will start to um, turn the tide of people realizing climate change, yeah, it's a planetary issue, it's a planetary challenge, but it's localized impacts. And if we don't continue to take action on the long-term solution, um, you know, we're looking at this in, you know, for our children and our grandchildren. Goes without saying, at the same time of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we need to take steps to, to protect our communities and our residents uh, from these impacts of a changing climate. So, I'm excited to be here. I think this is really a timely conversation. I think there is great opportunity, more opportunity than there has been in a, in a decade to actually achieve an international agreement to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And I think it, it, it can't come too soon, uh, as indicated by the experience here in California. So thank you for being here and good luck today.